I'm Capri, and welcome to We The Gamer Cast. that publishes every single Monday right here at YouTube.com slash Carpool Gaming and podcast services around the globe. Uh, thank you so much for being here, for listening, for telling your mom, for telling your dad, for telling your friends, for telling all the people. Uh, I wanted to uh, raise my glass, raise my McDonald's uh, Diet Coke here, but there's no straw in it. What am I doing? I just I just got in. I put it on my desk. I, I was, you know what, right here. Boom. We're going to open up this paper straw. How are you guys doing with paper straws? This is the way the world now, I think. Hopefully it's um, it's saving the oceans. I think that's the that's the point. How are you guys doing? What am I even talking about? It's middle of the day, so you're getting um, you're getting not tired, not waking up. This is actually like prime. This is prime time, man. This is we're ready to go. Uh, today's Sunday as I record this, and I'm getting shellacked in fantasy football. But you don't care about any of that. Thank you guys so much for being here. In case you're new, here's the deal. Every week I have sweet hangs with a stranger from the internet. And if you want to be on the show, it's easy. Just tweet at me at Sean Capri, Sean like Connery, Capri like the pants. And I was just reflecting a moment ago that like I, I booked four people uh, for the upcoming episodes of We the Gamer Cast, and I'm like, man, that's it. That's that's a month. That's uh, I, I can't bring on anybody sooner than one month from now, and that kind of stinks, man. Like that's why the dream of doing this full time is still alive. It's it's a far cry away from where we are right now, but it's still it's still it's still the drive. It just imagine. I don't know. I like, do you guys, sometimes people don't like getting their hopes up over anything. They don't like, you know, putting their dreams out there. I don't know. I can't help it right now, man. It would be, it'd be great to do this show. I was saying on Twitter earlier, like, I I feel like this would be like a two or three time a week show. Very similar to lots of other kind of more interview style shows with the news and stuff. Like, man, there's so much. Imagine if we had like a daily show on our carpool, like, you know, like just running down the, I don't know. There's so much that we could do. Patreon.com, speaking of which, making dreams happen, patreon.com slash carpool gaming. That's, that's us on the road towards this where I can just go like nuts to you, nine to five. We'll do content creation for plenty more than 40 hours a week. That's, that's the thing. You guys know it would work out to more than that because we're probably there for, like now, you know, like when I really, I don't even want to count it up. I've, I've, I've recently cleared out my whiteboards. Everything is, is ready for, a mind dump. I've got to, I've got to do some, got to get my mind back to planning. Okay. Where the summer's over, we're coming up to the holiday season. There's a gazillion games coming out. We've got reviews. We've got Ryan Turford here, Carpool Gaming, help us, helping us out with all the production. Man, we are rocking and rolling. And, um, it's all thanks to you guys, uh, especially at patreon.com slash carpool gaming, where you can support us if you like, just like nearly 90 people do. And I want to say thank you. So I will thank you to our ultimate producers, Robbie Bobby Miller, Tony Baker from Quest for Pixels at youtube.com slash Quest for Pixels, Dallas Ford, the co-host of the Blame Game. The links are in the show notes. So click on that and subscribe to them. Emily O'Kelly, Trucker Sloth, Jonathan Brown with the new EP from PME is called Gems. It's available on Spotify. Spotify and Apple Music, and probably in a gazillion other places as well. Lee Navarro, the fearless leader of the Phoenix Overdrive Extra Life team. Again, links are in the show notes. Please support these ultimate producers. Our platinum producers, Marcus McCracken, RJ Kern, and Skinny Matt, and all of our gold members, Anna, Cecily Carozza, Dallas Robbins, Drellish, Foolish Fuji, Jose Jimenez, Marcus O'Neill, Nagachaka, The Snack Network, and Tim Pollan. I don't think I missed you in the last week, Tim Pollan, but if I did, um, well, in any case, I'll say it twice if I did. Uh, uh, Tim Pollan, brand new gold member. Thank you for increasing your support, my friend. I miss you, man. We, it's been a while. We, we, we've touched. We've, 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 we've shared. We've, uh, we've broken bread together. It's great. We have actually broken bread with a lot of the people, uh, that I just mentioned and people who are listening. And that's very cool. And very soon, uh, the first weekend of November, Extra Life, by the way, extra-life.org slash participant slash carpool gaming. Fun- fundraising is officially started. Okay. I did my half marathon last week. Felt pretty good about that. I think I talked about that on the show. Uh, but Extra Life is, it's coming up. November is going to be here before you know it. It's it's uh, first uh, what third week of September here. Goodness gracious, you guys. We are making our contacts to try and get you guys some great prizes. So we're going to be raising some money. We just confirmed that the Nintendo dads are joining us in Rome, New York, and they're actually going to be with me and many others on the train from New York City to Rome. And so if you guys want to be part of that, contact me. Get get in the D- slide into those DMs if you want to be part of this. It's going to be magnificent. Lee Navarro, I mentioned as an ultimate producer, he was on the show a couple weeks ago. If you're curious to know, and if you need to like visualize what I'm talking about with Extra Life, um, go back a couple episodes. The Lee Navarro episode is great. We answer a lot of frequently asked questions and, you know, hopefully give you this 
the sense of you're going to be missing out. <laughs> if you if you don't jump on this, you are going to be missing out. It's going to be incredible. Uh, again, um, if you missed it on Twitter, I recently did a count and there are 10 people, probably even more. I feel like I'm missing somebody, but there's going to be 10 people on the train from New York City on the Friday before uh, to Rome, New York, where we're going to be doing Extra Life on November 5th, streaming until November 6th for 20, probably 25 hours because it's daylight savings. And how that always happens, I never know. But we're going to do it, and I'm excited about it. If you can't tell, I'm really pumped about it, man. Holy crap. Um, I'm gonna, I am gonna. think we're just going to jump into the episode because I kind of just, I just, I think I probably spoke 15 minutes worth in six minutes, and that was probably, that feels, it feels fast. So I need to take a breath. I'll let you listen to this conversation that I have with the wonderful Ryan Craig. Just the, the dulcet tones of Ryan Craig. You might know him as Mathman1024. He does a couple podcasts, the Backlog Busters, of course, and Are You Winning, Son?, and we, we talk about some of those as well as why you need math in your life and why you should appreciate your math teachers and all that stuff. We're going to jump into it. Here he is, my friend and yours, Ryan Craig. Hey, back in the day, um, a lot of times I would listen to the local sports talk radio on the way to work. And I was driving into work at you know, what, 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning. So, yeah, let me listen to the ups and downs of the local teams. And, you know, I think there were some personalities that I really liked. And so I kind of flipped mm-hmm. between the two different AM stations that we had that carried sports talk. But, I don't know, I, I stopped doing that. I don't even listen to the radio anymore. Yeah. When I get into the car, it's always, okay, whatever's on my phone, whether it's a, a book, a podcast, or just music. Because I like having, mm-hmm. I know it sounds really weird, Maybe not weird, but of course I probably have issues, but I like having control. We just yeah. got recently got a new car, and so it comes with you know three months of Sirius XM. And at first it sounds, oh, that's going to be really cool. But mm-hmm. then, okay, I don't like this song. I can't skip it. You I guess I need to change the channel to something else. I got to change the channel to something else. Well, I don't like that either. So it's just great. Thank you for the three free months. And now that's constantly going to be there whenever I'm trying to switch sources in the car it's and have there. to hear the the like channel one which is like oh don't forget that you can subscribe to Sirius XM radio no, satellite radio was going to be like it was it, it was probably about like 10 years too late like to like it needed it needed time to really like grab hold and it kind of happened at least as my memory recalls is kind of at the same time that like iPods were happening so you just had oh. to your point about control like this was a it was good quality and maybe access to channels you wouldn't otherwise have but everybody could just download whatever they want it was like the time it happened at napster time you know like why would you even why would you pay for it there's some people like stern i guess well i mean i look at my parents and they always have satellite radio now and all, and all do they cars. really they do like i'll get in my dad's like oh hey do you listen to the comedy station I'm like no i don't because yeah it's, it's not on my phone but they either listen to comedy or you know one of the oldies stations, which is, you know, I guess not really unusual because when I was growing up, that's what we listened to in the car. Whenever I was being yeah. taken to school, we had no control of what we listened to. So I grew up yep. listening to 50s, 60s, and 70s, and that's music that I really enjoy. That's what my kids listen to when we were in the car, plus mm-hmm. the stuff I grew up with in the 80s and 90s. And yeah, so they have a pretty eclectic taste when it comes to music. And I've finally yeah. gotten them to discern the difference between the Beach Boys and the Beatles. It's taken about 15 <laughs> years, but... <laughs> That's quite the effort. Because I'm like, oh, the song, song comes on and I say, okay, who is this? And they go, Michael Jackson? I guess the Beatles. Oh, like you're wow. Not even, you're not even close. But Yeah. But they, 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 they just know it's popular? Well, they just know it's one of the, the major ones that dad listens to amazing oh my gosh cool well at what point were you like listening to the radio when all of a sudden the radio itself leapt into your throat and just lodged itself there so that you would you would go on in life with with such a radio voice when did this happen when did this transformation happen were you six years old with the radio voice yeah (laughs) oh no 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 um well when i was a senior in high school uh i worked at the local radio station there and it is. wasn't anything more than just, you know, hey, we're there and we have a satellite feed that we're receiving from some other city in the country and we are just here to play commercials. 
And then if there yeah. are live events, we're you know cutting in. It's like okay, well we're going to go to uh, Flash Melton, who's live on the scene. Flash, how are things going down there at the court square? Mm-hmm. And so he would cut in and then cut back to me, play commercials, play some songs until you eventually worked it back into the satellite feed that was coming in. That's awesome. How the heck did you get into that? One of my friends got a job at the radio station first. And then I think I came on just shortly after that. I thought, well, this is, yeah. this would be fun. And it was my first, I guess I'd say, I would say it's my first real job. I did work for my dad for, gosh, since I was, you know, single digits because mm-hmm. he has, I said he had a hobby and it's still going now where he would go to model car shows and sell model kits. Okay. Like the, like the one twenty fourth scale, you know, kits, you know, the the glue and the paint and all that stuff. And I I mean, I get paid $5 a day to wake up at four o'clock in the morning, ride with him four hours someplace, work there for eight hours, take down, drive another four hours back home. I mean, Back then, five dollars seemed like a lot, but looking back, I'm like, no, wow, I was getting ripped off. Yep. That might be that might be child labor, right there. Well, yeah. I mean, it's like just just working with your dad, but you know that job at yeah. the radio oh, station yeah, was sure. my for first. Sure. Yeah, you know, that was the first real job. Like, okay, my own hours and getting a paycheck. Yeah, and the I think what kind of really threw me into the fire is one of the guys at the radio station who's actually a year or two younger than me. He had some kind of health issue, so I had to fill in for him for about six months for Sunday morning, and it was a shift that ran from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m., mm-hmm. and oh. and that was whenever- <laughs> That's a no, long you, shift, dude. I just did the math real quick. <laughs> it, it, it is a, it, it's not just, it's a long shift. You're not just sitting there going, okay, I got to make sure that I'm playing the commercials that people, you know, that sponsors have paid for, mm-hmm. but it's- Sunday mornings was playing live music. I mean, I guess me being in control of the music because it was, you know, playing your favorite Southern and bluegrass gospel hits on Sunday nice. singing time. And it was just to me the wildest thing because I didn't listen to that music. I mm-hmm. listened to the contemporary stuff and any Christian type music I was listening to at that time was maybe like, you know, Amy Grant, Michael W. Smith, something a little bit more. The contemporary stuff, not here is a super slow song. And sometimes people would call into the radio station requesting a song. I'm like, I have a, a stack of compilation CDs that you'd get like <laughs> two or three a month. And there was yeah. no, there was, and this is the thing. It wasn't that we are just clicking a file on a computer because mm-hmm. that's not, we didn't have that technology. Our commercials yeah. were played off of eight tracks. Oh my gosh, I love it. I had a record player, cassette player, CD player. So I was you know, just playing random stuff off of a CD. I was like, okay, well, man, I really got to go to the bathroom. So, oh, here's a good song. It goes for six and a half minutes. I'm going to put that on and <laughs> I got plenty of time. But then, you know, sometimes preachers would come in. And so you have to get mm-hmm. them set up, get their music queued up and all that stuff. So it was a, it was a fun time. I'm glad that I was able to experience that, but no doubt that was really my only time really being in radio until, you know, the past couple of years being, you know, doing podcasting stuff. Yeah. Once, once in radio, always in radio though, Ryan, I think that's the way, I think that's the, that's the way that saying goes. Were you like, I want to, there's a bunch of stuff I want to dive into there. There's like a technology front, but like, really the first thing that came to mind for me when you mentioned this was like, were you, always we're always inclined to do some sort of i almost think that that's almost like uh performative in some nature like you were you obviously were aware that you were going to be broadcasting for people to be listening like did that make you nervous or were you kind of captivated by radio itself or like yeah talk to me about like the venturing on into that i don't know that i was really captivated by radio i just looked at it as this is an opportunity for me to have a job yeah but in terms of performing That is something that I feel like I've always been drawn to, whether it's just doing silly stuff with my family, doing some of the local, you know, community plays, had a lot of fun doing that stuff. And I I really wish I could go back and do some more of that because there are places around here, but I don't really have the time to commit to doing something like that. But as a teacher, I look at my classroom as being my stage. And so that's where I can feel like I can get up there and perform and do some of the silly things that my children get embarrassed about. 
because I can do it there and <laughs> they never see it. Yeah. <laughs> like what? What are you talking about? Just weird voices. Some of those classic dad jokes, like you said, oh, you know, I'll have the, it. something. so you said something, what did you say? I click over here now. Too many, too many. Said, can, oh, in the inner You chat. said, excellent link incoming. And I said, oh, oh I didn't even be get joining it. us. Dude, I didn't even, I didn't even get what I even said. No, yes, no, link, link incoming. I, uh, you know, I call, we end up calling him Lincoln way more than I thought we would. I just thought like Lincoln was like the, like the, his legal name and that we would you know, <laughs> just refer to him as, as Link. Like it just thought we were filling in a space on the, on the form. But like, as it turns out, we, uh, yeah, we refer to him as Lincoln way more. It's very, that's not what I expected. The goal now, was Link. Say, when you say you refer to him as Lincoln more, I'm thinking that sounds like he's getting in trouble quite a lot. Yeah, right. Because when the, <laughs> yeah. when the full name comes out, he's got like, he's right. got two middle names that we could use, which is not what happens. He's actually he's our rule follower. Ellie is our demon, so um, she's <laughs> kind of unpredictable. She's a banshee, man. Holy cow! Um, but, but Lincoln likes to know like where the rules are and like like to, trying to anticipate like what to do and how to behave. So he's he's very much like that. Um, so no, it's not not a whole lot. But they, you know, like most kids i'm sure they just bicker and they just they know how to push each other's buttons and they just do it so so well like he he bugs ellie and then ellie lets her her absolute banshee screams go and it's all it's all a bit of a mess but just wait until they are teenagers yeah just wait yeah. my kids are two years apart and we can instantly go from you guys are having fun you are happy you're laughing at the top of your lungs and then the next moment I'm having to go in there and you know be some kind of referee. <laughs> I'm like this, yeah. like, this shouldn't be happening. You guys are 15 and 17. So like I, I, as your father should not have to be coming in here to have a discussion and to figure out, uh, okay, what did you say? What, what happened? Okay. Now let me check with your brother. Okay. What happened? And then just say, you know what? The classic father line. Well, I'm just disappointed in both of you. Disappointed, dude. I can hear the disappointment in your in your voice as you're telling the story. <laughs> I know you're not mad. That's pure and unadulterated, unadulterated disappointment. Oh man. So I just, I just that, let all that, those do they, emotions do they build sense up. It? Yeah. They probably do, but they don't care. Yeah. We're in that weird so, stage of. I mean, it's been going on for years. Just sure. I don't know if they care. I, I they really think that. I know nothing sometimes. And so oh, when yeah. I call them out on something, they go, what, what how'd you know I did that? I'm like, mm -hmm. I know, I know. Yeah. It's a superpower. Well, yeah. I mean, I can hear almost anything that happens in the house. The obvious. It's just obvious, really. <laughs> like they're not as secretive as maybe they'd like to think. I remember being like that. I remember wondering like how my mom knew, but I wasn't like, I didn't like sneak out or anything, but my, my parents always knew when something was up. They're much more, yeah, I mean, they know you better than you know yourself. I guess that's kind of our job. Yeah. I was, I was a very, I still am a rule follower. And so was my wife. Like the, like one of the craziest things that I would have done as a kid was to, you know, take the cereal box and tip it on its side to see if I can get the prize without yeah, having to eat all before. the cereal first. <laughs> yeah. And you do, and you do it with your siblings. Like, all right, let's, Let's see how it, what it is, and then we may have to share <laughs> or ask mom and dad to buy another box. But yeah, is that still a thing? Can I be honest with you? Like, we don't really go through a whole lot of cereal, or like that was a staple. I don't know if this is just a different time or if, if it's just us. Like, uh, like do people buy like is it is cereal every morning? I don't know. I feel like we're weird that we don't do cereal every morning. Well, I think I'm kind of a weird one because I have kind of a bowl of cereal every day. Whether it's for my breakfast or I save it for lunch, it's a treat for me. Gosh, I shouldn't even be saying this. It's like a treat for me <laughs> because you know I throw in. It is a treat. A, Cereal's delicious. But I don't see. I don't do the, the crazy, like super sugary stuff like I did growing up. Like growing up, I was like, oh, let me have a bowl of Fruit Loops because it's got some vitamin C and I'm being healthy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I look at the stuff that I ate. Like this is. How did my parents let me eat this? But, mm -hmm. you know, I throw in, like, I have a huge bowl, but only a small bit of it is cereal because I throw in a banana, a bunch of raisins, you know, a couple of scoops of granola, and then... Cereal salad. Some cereal. Well, yeah, I throw in, like, some some checks at the top, and that's that's it. 
Why is that? It just just like it's a that's like you took the entire remember the old commercials like it was a, like part of a balanced breakfast. So like you took that whole table and just like put it into the bowl. <laughs> like not citizen yeah, the, the, can't take up the whole table, just throw it all in the bowl. Yeah, part of this nutritionally balanced breakfast. Yeah, sorry, I'm telling you what. As a kid waking up Saturday morning so I can lay on the floor in the living room to watch cartoons, I'm yeah. not making a plate of toast and a glass of orange <laughs> juice and cutting up a fruit. I'm having just yeah. a bowl of cocoa pebbles. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm having. Yeah, and I, gotta, and I gotta say, cocoa pebbles is a great substitute for Rice Krispies to make Rice Krispie treats. Toss mm-hmm. with Rice Krispies. Oh, that's a good use idea. Cocoa pebbles, uh, <gasps> chocolate, and the marshmallow. So good. Okay, this needs to happen. Can I be like? Can I come back in like I don't know an hour or so? Can I just like <laughs> you just wait right there. Can I just go make some right now? <laughs> Would that be all right? If you got cocoa pebbles, go for it. No, I got to go to the store, but the store is the store is right around the corner. This is the thing like we don't have we don't have a whole lot. But were you always like rail thin like you're eating all this sugar cereal like it didn't you're just like metabolism through the roof? I guess so. Or were you walking 40,000 steps back then as well? So when I was younger, so my memory and I go back to eighth grade. So I just remember in eighth grade because I was thinking back whenever my kids were in eighth grade, especially my older son. I'm looking at him going like, I was not that big. I was not that tall when I was in eighth grade. My memory of eighth grade yeah. is I was maybe five feet tall, but sure. I was, I mean, okay. I was, I was, I was a bit rounder and maybe that's because the glasses I was wearing at the time <laughs> were the thick okay. plastic ones that kind of set, like my cheeks kept them up. <laughs> but then, <laughs> but then I hit puberty, you know, and what happened is my body just like grew vertically yeah. and I didn't gain any weight. And which yeah. was very disappointing because I remember the the lies they told me in health class in sixth grade, talking about purity and your changing bodies. And here's what's going to happen to the girls. And for you guys, your voices are going to deepen and you're going wow. to develop muscles. And I went, sweet. Mm, you got one. My of voice cracked, <laughs> still cracks now. And I'm, I'm still waiting for the muscles to come in. <laughs> but no. So like one summer, I just, I grew and I'd lost like a couple inches off the waist and added it to the inseam. And yeah. But that's kind of I the know, dream though. There's, there's a couple guys I remember doing the exact same thing, kind of rounder before. And then all of a sudden just like, boom, athlete or just tall, I guess in general. But I don't remember ever being promised muscles. That's a, I don't know if that, maybe I was at the wrong school, but it's like, <laughs> it's quite the, you're setting people up for, I think, disappointment. Cause I think overall you don't just get muscles. It's, I don't think this is a special case for you. I think it's for and most people. And I guess that's what I was thinking. Okay. This is going to happen. I'm going to go through these changes and I'm mm-hmm. not going to be in this dumpy little body, but <laughs> no, no. Yeah. But I know, I know that. See, the whole thing with the metabolism is that I know that it's not going to stay as it is. So I try to keep close tabs on that. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that I really watch what I eat, but I don't just constantly consume food. I try to be kind of careful. And I think part of it is I look at my my parents. I look at my brother. So Mm -hmm. my dad and my brother, we're all the same height, but we are not the same weight. And I don't want to, I, I don't want to get to the point where I feel like I'm going to be unhealthy. So, yeah. you know, the, the whole, like, I'm not walking 40,000 steps, but you know, my goal is 10,000 steps a day. And this year, all except for one day, I've hit 10,000 steps. So That's amazing. my dog who is at my feet, every morning we get up and we go for a couple of miles and then through, you know, throughout the day and then an afternoon walk, it's easy enough for me to get the 10,000 steps. Yeah. So I'm trying to be healthier than I was, say, before the pandemic. Because before the mm-hmm. pandemic, I would have said, you know what? I'm getting my exercise as I'm walking around the classroom teaching. And I wasn't doing oh. anything that was, this is exercise. I'm making a concerted effort to do something good for myself. Yeah. But, you know, I'm I'm no longer a spring chicken. So it's got to be careful about that. Yeah. I mean, is there any other, like, I don't want to just focus on the benefits, but like what else comes along with such a, such a commitment to dedicate yourself to 10,000 steps per day, every day, like talk me through like the mindset of that. And it, I don't know if there's benefits or side effects or anything that comes, comes along with 
with that is it is it too obsessive maybe that's the balancing negative side of it like where where do you land on all this you know i think last year it was to a point of obsession because i was doing the hero trainer stuff and yeah. it was like you know what if i hit my maximum steps which is twenty thousand, if yeah. i do that then i can earn enough of their in-game currency to redeem for a gift card it's like right. oh so let me do that and you know i'm doing online teaching so i have the time to go out and get all these extra steps yeah and for a lot of it, okay, this was a way for me to get out, get some fresh air instead of being cooped up inside the house. And I was able to burn through just a ton of podcasts and just, that was my way of just kind of dealing with a lot of stuff is just going mm-hmm. out and walking. And I know that there are times when it can feel almost like it is an obsession, but I know that doing it this is where I have to kind of, you know, get over this little mental hurdle of not wanting to do it. Right. I know that's good for me. And it's good for my dog. Um, I mean, she's not, I mean, she's about 40 pounds or so. And so it's yeah. not necessarily that she has to get out and run around a lot, but it's just good for her to get exercise. So I'm taking care of her, taking care of myself, getting fresh air. And that's just kind of what, what motivates me. Plus it helps with the stuff that I do eat, not seem so, doesn't make me feel so guilt ridden. Right. It's like, you know what? What I kind just of dog do you have? Tan. <laughs> okay. I mean, she is, is a like a mutt she, kind she, of thing. She is a, a super mutt. Yeah, she's just a mix of yeah. everything. We picked her. We got her from a shelter uh, coming up on three years now. Uh, next week it'll be yeah. three years. No, she's been where one does, of the best things. Where where does the where does the dry sense of humor come from? Like, is this is this something from your parents? Is it something you picked up with your friends or something? Like, I've always that's why I was excited to have you on because I'm just like. There's like this just deadpan with you that I really <laughs> appreciate. Like it just really cries just tan. I don't know. It's a quick witted deadpan that I I don't know. I'm wondering where that came from. So I'll I'll blame my dad. I think a lot of my dad's sensibilities come from him. Yeah. He is a yeah. he's an engineer. So, okay. That's all you gotta say. Yeah, yeah I mean it makes sense. It it's that, you know, my father in law also has the same kind of, you know, dad sense of humor, but it's not it's on a similar but slightly different level than my dad. Mm-hmm. Um, so like my father-in-law, if you say, oh, I'm hungry, he'll say, hi, hungry. I'm whatever. Oh yeah. Classic. That, that, yeah. That silly thing. But yeah, I think it's just been just years of, <laughs> it's like any craft, like podcasting, you have to work at it. So sure. every day oh, okay. I'm constantly honing and refining my skills. Oh, I this is intentional. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I do it with my students and I'll, I'll make math <laughs> jokes. And this Math is where I jokes. can, re- well, it's just the way it comes up with what we're doing, little puns yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And seven, I eight, nine. take a quick survey to see, okay, who's laughing? Who gets me? Yeah. It's like, oh, you get me? All right. You're in my special circle. Yeah. The rest of you people, uh, I'm kind of done with you. I always liked the teachers who like were aware that they had to keep attention, like maintain attention. And even in a, if it's an entertaining way or just make themselves notable at the very least. So it's not just like droning on and on all day about stuff. Like there, those are the teachers that you remember like years and years. I remember like, like probably a handful, maybe five or six teachers. I really, really remember growing up and they were all very much like that. Just kind of like, it's almost like um, it's almost teasing, but not like you're, you're aware that they probably don't want to be there, but like, let's just see, <laughs> let's see how we can, what we can get out of them. Yeah, one of my favorite teachers was a guy that I had for three years in high school. Had him for oh, wow. algebra yeah. two, pre cal, and calculus. And dude, we didn't even have those courses in high school. What high school did you go to? Well, I went to like a course dedicated to algebra. Algebra was like a chapter in like grade eleven math, like that where I where I grew up. Like you had like a full like semester of algebra in high school. Well, full year. Yeah. So the way the sequence goes around here is that you would, well, so I'm in Texas, so things are a little bit different than where I'm from, but you take, in order to get up to calculus at the end, you would take yeah. algebra one as an eighth, an eighth grade, then geometry, yeah. algebra two, then pre-cal slash calculus, uh, pre-cal, wow. sorry, pre-cal slash trigonometry, then yeah. the calculus. But it, where I'm from, you know, we didn't have like AP and honor stuff. So I had to yeah. take algebra, algebra one as a freshman, had to double up geometry and algebra two as a sophomore mm-hmm. so that I could get to calculus. 
I don't even know why I was doing that. I think my brother probably did that. And it was kind of this Were lots of kids doing this? Like, that's a lot of math. I mean, obviously, this is your handle, but like, that sounds like a lot of math. Well, I would say it's not for everybody. So yeah. my high school was the only public high school in the in the town that I grew up in. And there was one, I think there was just one other high school that was in the county. Mm-hmm. Um, there were some other small outlying areas that might have had elementary schools, but once you got to high school, like you were being bused to our school. Even yeah. the one, even the one other high school, they didn't offer things like biology two, chemistry two, and calculus. So they would bus yeah. their students for the second half of the day to our school. So we got to meet some people that oh, we wow. had not spent the last 12 years growing up with. Yeah. But in my calculus class, there were, I think, six of us. Mm-hmm. It was the only calculus class that was there. Unlike, you know, like around here, the school district that my older son goes to has, I think, eight or nine, maybe 10 high schools. And each mm-hmm. of them have like 4,000 students. Yeah. It's just like the stuff around here is They're just the high insane. schools from movies that are gigantic and yeah, two gyms, three gyms, something like that. Yeah. I walked my, went with my son to walk his schedule for his senior year. And just walking from the classes, you're going to be walking a couple of miles just to get between everything. It's like, whenever we got to go over here and here's the second floor and you know, here's like, this is just, that's what nightmares are made of. You can't make it to your class. Like you just keep walking down this hallway that never ends. It keeps extending and like the, it just keeps going and going. That sounds like what this would look like in real life. Well, yeah, you stand at one end of a hallway and it just seems to go on forever. Mm -hmm. And this is why kids have got wheels on their shoes. Their schools were too big. You need to just, yeah. like wheel down the hallways. Yeah, I mean, my high school was, I, I would say it was pretty small. I mean, I, I don't think it changed much between when my dad went there and then when I went there. But now when I go back, you know, they have added and built onto it. It's just, it's so weird. So mm. I, I haven't like really walked the halls. But yeah. just you see what they've added on the outside. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's kind of amazing. So are your kids in, cause, cause like I'm trying to think for me in high school, the, the only analog I would say is the sciences, which maybe is a bridge over to the math, but like we had chemistry, physics, and bio, and that's how oh. it broke up. And in, in grade 10, we had like just a general science class. And then after that, you could take one or all three of those science classes, but we never had math broken up into its disciplines or whatever you would call it. So that. was it just like, like math one, math two, math three, something like that? Yeah. Yeah. 10, 20, 30 is what we would have grade 10, 11, 12. That was it. And if you were really smart, you could do um, 30 and or like 31, which was like pre-calc, which would then you, you take okay. like a real calculus course in, in university. And this might be just specific to where I am in Canada. I can't claim to know anything else about this country, but yeah, that was so this this notion of like a full year of like geometry is like totally fascinating. Like we had a chapter I remember very specifically at the end of grade 12 math, like that was just proving circles. And that was like absolutely hell because we just wanted out of there. We were at the end of high school <laughs> and you're like, now you want to talk to me about proving circle? What the heck does that even mean? I didn't understand that. I don't know. Would that be would that be geometry? So geometry would encompass quite a lot. So I remember yeah. the first half of the year was doing the two column proofs. So you start with some of the, the basic ideas of geometry and then, and I didn't really appreciate it at the time of, you know, here's a statement and then here's the reason. And I try to connect that whenever I'm tutoring geometry or whenever I'm in my classroom, I say everything that we do has a reason. So the stuff that we do in math is not just you're doing a math problem, but it's for anything that you do. If you're writing an essay, if you are communicating with anybody, whatever you say, you have a way that you are backing that up. There's a reason for why you say what you say. Yeah. And so that was the first half as you're learning about, you know, parallel lines and all this other stuff, the properties that connect with everything. And the second half, you still had some of those proofs that most people dreaded, but then you got to do some more of the the algebra and like, here are the figures and let's find, you know, values for lengths, values for angles and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. But I mean, algebra too, you know, covers, at least what I can remember of it. And then from tutoring around here, I mean, it covers quite a lot. It's basically the same stuff that I cover in my college algebra class, plus a little bit extra. What do you say to the kids who inevitably come up to you and, and ask 
uh, what am I going to use this math for? Why, like, am I just using this math in case I want to become a math teacher? Like, I'm sure that that's such a creative and unique thing that, that a student will probably say to you at least once or twice a year. Yeah, that happens a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I would tell them, I would say, you know what? Fail, get out of my classroom. <laughs> yeah, I was like, well, where are you going to use this is whenever you take your test. That's just kind of a cop out and stupid answer. Right, right. But I, I say, you know what? You, will, you may never use the exact thing that we're talking about right here. But what I hope I can do is to show you how this connects to some of the stuff that you see in the real world. Like yeah. we may talk about piecewise defined functions, which sounds horrible and ugly Sorry, and nasty. What, what is that? What? It's a function that's defined by little pieces. Okay. And I say, you guys use these all the time, but you just don't realize it. And so I use yeah. examples of if you go to a buffet, the price that you pay at a buffet oftentimes is determined by your age. It's not the same for everybody. So it's determined by almost like little pieces. Mm-hmm. Or if you try to figure out how much do I owe for income tax? Well, yeah. the whole thing is a piecewise defined function. And we kind of go over that, which is kind of nice that we show them how it does connect with what we're talking about, but also a, okay, guys, let's make sure you understand about income tax. Because I think yeah. there are a lot of things that students don't know when it comes to finances. Because I don't know, like 15 years ago, I remember having a student who told me that she did not want to make more money because then she would end up being taxed more and she would actually make less money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people actually believe it. And I went, and I didn't really understand why she was saying that. Mm-hmm. But people talk about the tax brackets and they think, oh, yeah. but if it moves me into a higher tax bracket, they it's don't the understand amount. that it's not the whole amount that gets taxed at that. Yep. It's just the amount that you earn above and beyond. beyond. I guess mm-hmm. I didn't really understand it back then to explain it to the student. But I, I think that I think that's one of the trickiest parts about teaching is even understanding because you know, you're not you're not exactly reading from the teacher's guides. I don't get that impression from you. Like you you know the math inside and out. I don't. My textbook has not been opened in years. It yeah. sits on the top of my desk, and I have other stuff on top of it. I just go in and I say, all right, here's what we're gonna do because it's the same stuff that I've been doing for 20 years. I don't mm-hmm. need the textbook because if we were to follow along exactly with what the textbook says, it's going to just confuse you. So mm. when they do their homework, they do their homework online through this, um, the online component that is connected to the book publisher. Yeah. And they just, you know, bring up, the, bring up the problem, type in their answer, but sometimes they could click help me solve this review and example. And already this semester, we're only three weeks in, I had a student say, this is what it was showing me to do for it. And I said, don't do that. They are yeah. making it more complicated. Here's what we do. They go, that's so much easier. Yes. Yes, it is. So if you listen to what I say and you follow what I do, it's going to be so much easier than what they're trying to get you to do. Yeah. I remember having instances like that. I don't know if it was really ever, because obviously it wasn't online or anything, but I don't know if it was like, I just remember all it took sometimes was just to ask a question and I would take my nose out of the book and and it would become so much clearer. So like the value of having somebody walk you through it, it was almost like it felt like cheating, actually. It felt like more like <laughs> cheating talking to the teacher than than like looking at the examples in the in the in the textbook. And I will say, like again, I was really excited to chat with you because math was the subject, probably in grade eight, if I can remember correctly. It math was the subject, and it probably even French too where I discovered that I really like learning. Like I had figured something out in math in grade eight or something. And I was like, that feels amazing. Like that was <laughs> totally, and it was probably something, you know, fairly simple, um, hopefully simple now. I don't know. Um, but it was, it was totally foreign to me. And then it became clear. And then I could apply that rule to all the other things. And I'm like, I see the, it felt like I was seeing the matrix, you know, just like, I don't see the world as it is. I see the numbers and the grids and I was Neo, like, way before, well, somewhat before the matrix became a thing. But like, I'm, I'm curious if like how often you might see that in your students, or is that even a reason why you would become a teacher instead of just following your dad to become a, an engineer? Like, I know there's a lot to unpack there, but. When I was in eighth grade, I had the dream of following my dad's footsteps and being an engineer. Yeah. He's a mechanical engineer. Um, and he's since retired, but you know, me 
and my buddy, we were going to go to the local branch of the state university and then transfer just like my dad did because, um, so I grew up in Tennessee. So there was a university of Tennessee branch an hour away, go there for two years, and then go to the main university of Tennessee in Knoxville. But eventually my friend dropped out of high school in his senior year. And I was just still, just, I was just lost thinking, I don't even know what my dad does as an engineer. Like, yeah. I don't know that he ever really brought work home. He was, mm -hmm. he was always home at the same time, always left at the same time. But I never got a sense of, okay, this is what he does. This is how he's using math. This is how he's using science and how he's thinking. And I, maybe I just never asked him or asked the right questions. Because my dad and I didn't really get along too well. I'm not saying that, that we fought, but it was strange. Things were always strained, but mm. strained between us. I mean, I'm the youngest of three. And it was a lot easier to talk to my mom than it was to my dad. I mean, yeah. fast forward several years. And when I call home, it's a lot easier to talk to my dad than it is my mom. Interesting. Or it's it's funny because my brother doesn't have that same kind of relationship. Yeah. But um, anyway, so I was really thinking about- but Hang on, before we go on, why, why the switch? Oh, yeah. What happened there? Sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take us way off track here. I, I think something- maybe happen with how we interacted once my older son was born. Okay. I, yeah. I, I think that was kind of the, the turning point. I could see um, it. I don't know. It, it, it took a while for me to, and it's something that I still struggle with. And this is kind of like a, you know, a deep psychological thing. And mm -hmm. I should probably be laying prone on a, on a couch as I'm staring at the ceiling, <laughs> explaining to you what's going on. I can bring it like, yeah, I can, we, I can get my chair, you know? Okay. Make Talk sure you have it. your, just make sure you have your, your pipe and your smoking jacket. <laughs> but I, I, I totally lost. What was, I, what was I talking about? Oh, my dad. I have this struggle of still feeling like I am a five-year-old kid trying mm. to earn his favor around him. And like for the longest, when I would go back and visit my family after moving to Texas or even going up to college, like I just wanted him to be proud of me. I don't mm -hmm. know. Maybe that I felt that he wasn't, but it wasn't ever anything that he verbalized. So yeah. I did not come from a house where my dad was like, I'm so proud of you. I love you. That wasn't, I think part of that was how he was raised. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. So we just never really had those conversations. And I remember calling home when I was in college and just hoping that my mom would be the one who answered the phone. Mm -hmm. So it was a conversation I had one time with my dad. I said, oh, hey, is, is mom there? Nope. Um, uh, how are you doing? Okay. Um, how are, how's everybody else doing? Fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, well, I guess I'll talk to you later. Love you. He's like, make sure you check the oil in the car. Yes, sir. Seriously? Dad. Yeah. It was just, and that's just kind of how it was. But again, now, like I said, it's completely different. When I go up there, like I want to be able to spend time with my dad, whether that is, you know, going to the church gym and playing basketball or just walking around the neighborhood and talk about who lives in what home and, you know, the changes that have happened or one of the last times that I was up there talking to him about how did you meet mom? Because mm -hmm. that was a story that I wasn't, that I didn't think I knew. And it was just, no, it's just, it's a good time. It's fun to talk to my dad. We can talk about weather. We can talk about football. Uh, and that was something that growing up, like he would watch Tennessee volunteer football. And I never understood the rules. I didn't know what was going on. I could not understand football. And so I felt like, okay, here's this disconnect between me and my dad, something that he likes to watch. And I don't get it. And it wasn't until I went to college and I started going to football games that it clicked. And yeah. I understood it. And so now, you know, having some of these conversations with my dad that I couldn't have had before. Do you think at some point, maybe it was, you know, when, when he became, was that, was that him becoming a grandparent? Like you're the youngest, so probably not. I uh, know. Uh, my two kids are the first two of the, of the grandkids. And then yeah, the, the, like a few months later, after my second was born, my sister had her um, oldest. 
so do you think that there maybe that's something of it like that that's got to be i can't imagine you know hopefully many many years into the future and my kids have their kids and like it's just like maybe i don't know what does it exactly represent it's almost like a final stage maybe like that's that's it like maybe he could let himself off the hook maybe he re- had some sort of realization maybe he was done in a way maybe you had earned some sort of favor or some sort of approval like that he was done teaching you and he could become more of like a, a friend type of thing. I think there've been a lot of things uh, going on, especially in terms of his life and what he's been going through with, um, you know, some things that happened with, with his job and being laid off and then getting hired back and all this just crazy stuff would not something I would not want to have to go through with my job and just, um, the path that, um, I guess he was on with, with my mom. I mean, they're married, not, not divorced or anything like that, but just some emotional things that they were going through. Um, but there was this sense and not sense, but they flat out told us that, you know, we're not ready to become grandparents. And it was just like, like things you see in the movie or what you hear from your friends, like once you're married, you know, the, your parents or your in-laws are constantly saying, when are we going to have grandkids? Right. But my parents were like, we don't, you know, we're not ready to be grandparents. You know, we have, you know, grand puppies or whatever. I'm like, okay. And so we felt, I don't know, a little bit put off from that and didn't want to, you know, tell them that, oh, we're actually trying to have a kid. I mean, eventually we did tell them. And I think so you're was- married and this is something that would naturally happen. They're telling you like, we don't want this. Like, it's not really up to them. Right. Well, they're saying they weren't ready to become grandparents. It was, I know it just sounds kind of, kind of weird, but that was, yeah. It that sounds like really was hard saying, to deal with. Yeah. I think we held on to that for, for several months. And we, I remember having a conversation in December of 2003 with my parents saying, Hey, I just want to let you know that we're actually, you know, trying to have a kid. Like we want to have a kid. And yeah. I said, Oh, we're happy for you. That, you know, that'd be great. So something happened in the months that must have changed their minds. Yeah. And I think that must have been some kind of stress that was like hanging over us because yeah. that was in December. And then my, our first child was born the following October. Yeah. I, I just have to think about like, you know, it's one of those, that that's a feeling that could happen. It's something I don't necessarily like understand right now, but I'm trying to, as, as the years go on, I'm tr- definitely trying to be better about that sort of thing because there's been so many times when somebody is either older or just simply the same age but more mature and going through something or expressing something that I don't understand. And instead of trying to understand or practicing some sort of empathy or compassion, I just go like, well, that's dumb. And or some version <laughs> of that. Like that's like how or how could you like there's some sort of like judgment there. And it's like now it's almost I, I just appreciate almost like the heads up that maybe that's something that can just have, you can't even help it that maybe it's a mortality thing. Maybe it's, I don't know exactly what it is, but um, that, or just dealing with the fact that the life's clock never stops. Like it just keeps going no matter what you do. The days keep going, the years keep passing by and that can freak you out. I think whether it has to do with mortality or just that you, though there is a lack of control of that. Even that mortality it, that, that's a it's a great point that you bring up so i'm not sure how it was from my parents perspective but right two I think it was a couple of years ago we lost our last grandparent between the two of us mm-hmm. so when my wife and i got married combined we had 10 grandparents because yeah. she had a, a set that divorced and remarried and then you know, one by one, they start passing away. And so in my mind, there has been this extra layer for my mortality. There's me, you know, Mm -hmm. still feel like I'm young, invincible. You know, I'm in, as far as I know, I'm I'm in pretty good health. We'll see when I go for a physical in a few weeks. Yeah. Then there's my parents, you know, all all of our parents are still alive. And there's my grandparents. Like there's this hedge of protection for my mortality. That makes sense. Yeah. And then, that layer was completely gone. And it, it was just like when my grandmother passed away, it was with such a sense of finality. I was like, there's, there's no, there's no protection now for my parents or my mm-hmm. in-laws. And so logically 
I'm thinking about, okay, who's going to be the next person who's in next? my family to pass away? Yeah. I'm not looking at, you know, my cousins. I'm not really thinking about my, I'm probably the next person to pass away is going to be like one of my, you know, great uncles who, you know, is still alive. And he, you know, he was a POW from World War II. So he's, you know. Wow. Yeah. He's definitely way up there in his 90s. Like, okay, he's probably going to be the next one. But think about like the closeness of that I have with my parents, with my in-laws. I'm like, this is, I hate thinking about it, but mm-hmm. they're, you know, they're all in their seventies and I shall know it. Yeah. It wouldn't take much for something to happen. And then my mind starts going down this rabbit trail of how is that going to affect, I mean, not even me so much, but how's it going to affect my family? How's it going to affect my children? How's it going to affect my wife? And, you know, Try not to think about that and just kind of, you know, live in the moment and spend mm-hmm. as much time as I can. Fortunately, my in-laws live in, you know, they live like 10, 15 minutes away. So we get to see them every weekend or yeah. at least every week. My parents are a different story. They're, you know, 800 miles away. Yeah. How are you thinking about that? 800 miles away. Is that, is that tough? Uh <laughs> It's weird to talk about this because it sounds like I have no heart and I have no emotions, but for the most part, it, it doesn't bother me that much. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't even know why. I don't know if it's just because of the way that I was raised. Yeah. I wasn't like when I went off to college, it was four hours away from home which I always t- told people it was close enough that you could go home every weekend if you wanted to, but it was far enough away that you didn't feel that you had to. Like mm, if you lived an hour but, away from home yeah. or if you went to school an hour away from home, it's like, Oh, what? It's only an hour drive. So go home every weekend. Yeah. But I remember as a sophomore, I came back from Christmas break as a sophomore and I didn't go back home until probably the end of May. Mm-hmm. I just, Stayed on campus, you know, spring break with, with friends. But I mean, I miss being able to see my parents, but at the same time, I, there's, I feel there are a lot of things that they still don't really grasp or understand about like what our life situation is like. I'm not yep. sure how much you know about our family, but uh, my older son is on the autism spectrum on the high functioning end. And my younger son has celiac disease. So taking them places can be a bit of a challenge for many reasons. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes my parents don't totally get that whenever they send me a birthday card with a gift card to Subway. (laughs) Well, I guess I could get sodas from Subway, but. Oh man. Yeah. It's just been like a, it's still a learning process for them or they might say, you know, they don't really understand I guess what we still need to do or watch out for with my older son. I mean, right. He's, he's going to be 18 next month, but there's still some things like, okay, he's not quite ready to be on his own as an 18 year old. Yeah. We're still, you, you, there's still some life skills that, that you need to do. There's still some maturing that you need to do in order to, to do that. And it's, it's stuff that my parents aren't always around. And so yeah. they don't really know all the stuff that we're going through. Mm hmm. But, you know, I try to get back up there maybe once a year. But again, yep. it's, it is it is hard because when we go, like, we have to pack all of our food. I know it sounds like so, something so silly and stupid, but when you go to a small town in Tennessee, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to go out to eat because there's no place to go to eat. Right. And my parents don't have things that are safe for my kids. Mm-hmm. So we end up taking, I think when it was just me and the two boys, like we packed lasagnas and enchiladas and chili. We had all the stuff to actually feed everybody. Yeah. Um, and then it was like, Oh, these enchiladas are too spicy. I'm like, Really? <laughs> this is spicy. Why is it always like that, man? Oh my gosh. Yes. I know. I sadly, I, I feel like I know what that's like. And that's just, it's so frustrating. You know, it's just like, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a double fail. Yeah. <laughs> being, yeah, like being I worked, picky I in and of so, itself is like like thanks for the food how about that uh, you know yeah i mean like i worked it. so hard to make the food for me and to have enough for you to share yeah. 
And then it's like, oh, no, that's, you know, that was too spicy or I don't know, the, the lasagna. Like, it's lasagna. Like, everybody likes lasagna, right? And then finding out that one of my nieces, like, I don't like lasagna. What? Yeah, it's gross. Do like you like spaghetti? Lasagna. I do, but not lasagna. I'm like, oh. all right. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that, that's fine. I'm sorry, man. That that sounds that sounds really challenging. Is that maybe that's why uh, you just take it out on other people's kids as a teacher? <laughs> well, I mean, you have to keep in mind that the students that I teach are either right out of high school all the way up to you know forties, fifties, sixties. Oh I wow! Mean, I don't think I realized I mean, that. Well, I teach at a community college. Sure. I mean, not that that really says anything, but typically at a four year university, you're going to have a much larger portion of students that are in that traditional age from, you know, 18 to 22. Yeah. But, you know, I have, I think there's a mom in there who has like five-year-old twins. You know, there's a a guy who's, I'm going to assume he's in his thirties. I actually had someone one time, this has been like a dozen years ago, who knew my father-in-law's older sister and went to school with her. That's crazy. But, and the, the only reason I found out is because she said what high school she went to. And I said, and that high school doesn't exist anymore because mm. it became like district offices or something. And then kind of got down this path and said, yeah, my father-in-law went there and mentioned the name. And she said, oh, was his sister so-and-so? I said, I'm not sure. Was she married to some of the work for the post office? I don't know. Checked with my father-in-law. Sure enough. It's like, And so here's this woman who was probably at, at the time like 60 sitting next to this 18 year old kid right out of high school. Yeah. But it's, but that's the stuff I love. Like my students are from, like they're from all over the world and they're just age range is, is crazy. Like this summer I had a student that was from, uh, from Venezuela and it was the first semester that she was in college. First semester, first few months in the United States. And I was her first professor. Mm hmm. And I just, there's, there's this great, well, a little bit of pressure, but also this fantastic privilege that, you know, I get to be your first experience of what it's like to be in an American classroom. Yeah. Um, But it also, because her language, her English skills were were really good, but there's still some things that I knew would would probably trip her up. So I really avoided doing any kind of weird voices or I avoided Mm -hmm. speaking too fast where she might get lost. Yeah. And I would, you know, say things, try to say things as clearly and coherently as possible and as grammatically correct as possible so that that would just help her with the English language. See, that doesn't sound like the type of empathy that one would get from a father who's an engineer. I don't know. Maybe that's just, I'm obviously painting with a very broad brush here, but I don't know. Is there, is like, is there like this, I think about my, um, my best friends growing up, um, dad was a lawyer mom was like a, a teacher arts teacher and so they like the the art side and the i guess more analytical side created two engineers like it was it's almost as mathematical as i feel like it can, it, it could get but you could definitely see like the mom and the dad's personalities in these kids because it just seemed like so extreme like it was like opposites attract like the the lawyer dad was a lawyer and he was very serious and you know, very right. funny, but like he, he was, he was very, very serious all the time. And his mom, the mom was, she, she was flamboyant and she was loud and, and hilarious and jovial. And so you, it's funny to see that as an example, um, to create these two, two kids who kind of will have each, either one of those sides shine. I'm curious for you, as far as like the analytical mind seems like it comes from an engineer dad, but like this empathy that I'm sensing from knowing that something that you like to do might trip somebody up. That's not, that's not just going in and doing your job. That's something else. Right. So that kind of empathy is not innate. It is something that I have to consciously work at. And it's something that I've learned a lot from my wife. Like she has done a fantastic job of trying to, you know, sand off some of those rough edges that I have. Hmm. And I know that the way I was as a teacher when I started, you know, 20 years ago is not the same as I am now. I think I have a lot more empathy for my students. I think I care a lot more about them. 
as individuals and as a whole, but it's something that has just been this gradual process, this, you know, this change with me. Um, and again, I credit a lot of that to my wife because I would say like, Oh, look at what this student did. And you know, this is horrible. Yeah. And then she would come out from a different perspective. I'm like, Oh, okay. That, that makes sense. Maybe I shouldn't mm-hmm. be so harsh with my grading or, having to work on my tone whenever I'm speaking to my students so they know that I do care about them and I care that they learn. I'm like, yeah, you know, on, on Thursday I was leaving work, needed to leave to go pick up my son and the door to the office suite didn't close all the way. So I went back to, you know, close it. And there was a student that was just next to the door in this little study, you know, cubby. And he, you know, called my name. Hey, Mr. Craig. I thought he was just saying, hey, but then he said he had a question. It's like, ah, uh, okay, look at my mm-hmm. clock, look at my watch. Uh, okay, okay. So I went to go help him. And I was telling my son about this later on after I picked him up. And he said, well, you're just doing your, yeah, it's fine that you were, you know, I had to wait a couple minutes. That's no big deal. You were just doing your job. It's what you get paid to do. I said, well, yes and no. But I also know that by helping this student with a problem, that is going to make them probably more willing to work hard in my class. Mm-hmm. And it's going to, it helps me be approachable. I'm not so standoffish. They know that they can come to me for questions, that they can trust me. And I want to be able to build that kind of relationship with my students. I don't want to be some random person, some robot at the board who's just doing stuff that they're copying without knowing what they're doing, why they're doing, or thinking that the person doesn't even care because I've been in those classes. Yeah. I feel like I've just been, I'm just a number and I don't Mm -hmm. really care. But those classes where the teacher plays with the students, they interact with them. Those are the ones that I remember. And those are the ones that I'm, I'm much more willing to work for you when I can see that, that you care about what you're doing and about, you know, how we are learning. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting going back to kind of the the start of all that, where, and I've done this before talking to people on this show too, where I, I attribute you know characteristics that are brought down either you know hereditary stuff or a uh, product of our environment or how we're raised, like as a mom and dad thing. But what you actually just said is something that like completely changed my own perspective on it, and one that I definitely experienced personally is like. What a great thing to say um, and to hold true about your partner is that this doesn't have like we are not formed complete when we leave the nest. We can still we can still form and become better or more complex and add color to our personalities and to our approaches. And I would say like in the best case scenario, if you partner up with somebody who complements and enhances and adds to what you already are, like that's that's kind of what I heard from that is that it wasn't a, a parental or how you were raised kind of thing. It was more of a product of, of your partnership and your, and your marriage and just who you ended up and who you chose. I shouldn't say ended up with like who you, who you chose to spend your life with and grow your life with. I think that's amazing. Yeah. It, so we've been married for, I guess we're coming up on 23 years at wow. the end of this year. And there's so much, wrong that I had in my mind about how I thought a marriage was going to go mm. or what I thought my role in the marriage was supposed to be. Right. And you know, we've had some tough conversations over the years, things that I was just, I was oblivious to. Yeah. And part of that could have just been my upbringing and, you know, totally undiagnosed, but I wouldn't be surprised if I were also on the autism spectrum. Yep. I definitely have sure. some of those, some of those quirky type signs that you know, in this day and age, if I were a kid, I probably would have been tested. I would have been, you know, thrown onto that spectrum. Mm. But, you know, these conversations with, with my wife, it's like, oh, I didn't realize that that's what was going on. I didn't realize that's how it made you feel. Yeah. And I, I have to change some of the things that are going on here because I don't want to hurt you because I, I love you. And we are like, we were brought together for a reason not of my own choosing, not that, you know, I had control over this. It's just, I think the way that you look at how we met, like there's really no way, there's no reason in the world that we should have met. But 
you know, I want to What do you be... mean by that? What do you, how did you meet? I don't know how you guys met. We met in college. Yeah. But we met at Mississippi State. So she's from here. She's from Texas. I'm from Tennessee. I had zero connection to Mississippi State. Had never even heard of them. Didn't know that they were even part of the... I didn't know they were part of the Southeastern Conference, you know, a big football conference or a sports conference. I had no clue about that, even though my dad went to an SEC school. And my wife, I, I ended up here because they sent me a letter. Um, you know, sometimes you get letters from schools because if you do well enough on your ACT or SAT, it's like, oh, you know, we'll waive your out of state. We'll give you some scholarship money or whatever if you come to us and boost up our overall score. It's like, yeah. okay, well, I don't really know where else I'm going to go. So you just really require my name and address. Okay. And I like checked out the campus and stuff and it was it's cool. So, I mean, I really have, there's no reason I should have gone there. And I think mm-hmm. the last time that someone from my school had gone to Mississippi State had been like six years before me. Yeah. Again, I didn't even know where it was. And she ended up at Mississippi State because her best friend growing up had an older sister who had gone to Mississippi State. And just on a whim, she you know listed Mississippi State as a college to send her test scores to. And so we both end up there. And I don't know, I, I was a year older than her. And I remember the first time that I met her was that um, there's a student ministry called the Wesley Foundation. So kind of connected with Methodist Church. And when I was there as a freshman, somebody introduced themselves to me and made me feel welcome. And so that just meant the world to me because I went to other places and no one even acknowledged me and I never mm-hmm. went back there. Yeah. But this, you know, this girl introduced herself. I was like, oh, cool. So the next year, I remember seeing my wife, my, well, before she was my wife, sitting alone on a couch during these opening weekend festivities that the Wesley Foundation had. You know, a lot of, you know, games and worship and food and all kinds of stuff. I said, you know what? I'm going to introduce myself to her and try to make her feel welcome. Mm-hmm. And I still remember, you because know, Because somebody else had made you feel welcome? Right. And so I introduced myself to her and there was just something about her and I just could not get her out of my mind. No matter what I did, could not. It, it, I don't know if you've ever had the, the experience where you like somebody, but being an awkward person, you don't know how to express that or you're afraid of rejection and you're hoping that something, there, there's a clear sign. And so I kept hoping for that and not getting that because my wife is super introverted, which is, mm-hmm. which works well for us. Yeah. And I, went through all these stages of, you know, I'm just not going to like her, like her. I'm just, she's just a friend. Yeah. We're going to be cool. And then I would <laughs> yeah. see, and then the next moment that I would see her, my heart would kick my brain out the window. Like, no, 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 no. That's the one. Mm-hmm. And I just, yeah, I think finally started dating at the end of her freshman year and, you know, never looked back. Was, was there just, a sign? Did you end up getting a sign? Like you were waiting for like, how did you, it seems like you still I, had something to overcome there. Well, I remember in that summer, um, just like praying, like I was praying to God. It's like, I just, you know, what, you know, what, what do I do? And just mm-hmm. like, it was like hearing this audible voice saying, marry her. And I went, okay. So I think we were engaged after having dated for six months. Mm-hmm. And then you know, got married the, you know, the next year. So is it a, a more of a, I'm trying to, th- trying to think of how this would work. Like, is it just by chance that she maybe has a similar relationship or faith as you, or is that the case or like, how did, how did that work? You are obviously um, attributing a lot of this to God and to praying. Like, is that where her mindset is as well? How do you guys mesh on that front? Yeah, um, we had different experiences growing up. Like I, I don't remember a time not being in the church. Like yeah, grew up there. My parents still go to the same church that I was baptized in. They've been going to for just decades. For her growing up, she fell more under the you go on Easter and Christmas. 
Right. Um, or yeah. when she would stay with one set of grandparents that you know would go every Sunday. And it, I don't think she really got into going to church until she was in high school and with a youth mm-hmm. group. Um, but yeah, and that's definitely our faith, you know, brought us together. And that's been like an anchor for a lot of the stuff that we go through. Um, it's great because there are a lot of times that, you know, doing our daily Bible reading and she has a plan and I've got my own little plan that I'm doing and just like, we'll come across things and we can actually have conversations with each other about it. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's weird to say, you know, it's fun, but you know, we can find the the fun in, in the scripture or like seeing it from a different perspective and just being able to talk, you know, bounce ideas off of each other. You know, like, did you notice this? Here's something that I noticed I'd never noticed. And I've been reading, mm. I've, I've read the same thing probably 20 times and yeah. here's something new. I love that. Cause like, you know, chances are could have been anything could have been anybody else could have been anybody of another faith or no faith or anything like that. And I would imagine that that would not been easy or maybe made it impossible to go any further. But to your point, like there's just a lot of, um, boxes that were checked to put you in the right place. You were the right people for each other at the right time. Like could have been here, but you were there. And I love that. That's like one of my favorite things to do is just kind of like explore those. I should have zigged, but I zagged and that put me in a better spot. Like it's, um, especially I think for you and I very similarly, I think on this front, very careful about certain things, very, um, you know, we analyze decisions and we look at like trying to anticipate like, where is this going to take us? And I think I'm in a similar boat as far as I could have been somewhere else, but I ended up in a place that put me next to this other person. And it's like, well, that's amazing. Maybe I should lighten up on all my analytical decision making. Like maybe it's (laughs) not the best thing. It's the whole you stop looking and then you find the person. Like, I just think that that's that's incredible. And I I figured that there might have been something there. So I kind of wanted to see like what you meant by you shouldn't have been together. I always like, okay, wait a second. I like this serendipity i mean yeah like the there's someone that i dated as a freshman and you know also from tennessee and it's one of those things i go back and i think what would have happened if i had like really tried if that relationship had kept going and the clear answer is Mm. that would have ended it would have ended in divorce like right 100 guaranteed like that was a divorce waiting to happen like when yeah. you're in like the good times of that relationship, you don't really see that. But like when you are able to take a step back, you Big see like all the, all the warning signs were there. And, you know, I tell the story a lot, even to my students sometimes just like, Hey, here are some life lessons from Mr. Craig, you know, <laughs> you're not going if, anywhere if, until that bell rings and I got something to say. <laughs> oh, oh, the last on, on Thursday, somehow we got to, I get off on tangents a lot and I just can't help myself because of who who I am. (laughs) I would do the same thing. But I said something about um, some young adult novels. I think I was talking about Hunger Games and almost got into an argument with one of my students talking about a movie. I said, oh, you mean the movie where such and such? I went, no, that's the second one, not the third one. She goes, no, it was the third one. I'm like, stop. I know this stuff. (laughs) Trust me. But then I mentioned another young adult series and I said, I've got opinions. And this student said, really? I want to hear them. I said, you know what? Not right now. If you want to hear my opinions about this series, stay after class. So she stayed along with another student to hear my opinions about a series. It was I love just kind of fun. I love it when that, students that makes stay. me want to become a teacher like right now. Like all of us podcasters, we've we we need we need an audience, man. <laughs> we can have like a live interaction with people. It sounds amazing. Well, so you, you know, know that- with parents and you know. Are you familiar with the the 10,000 hour rule? Yeah. Yeah. So a while ago, I started keeping track of all the classes that I've taught and Mm -hmm. how many contact hours that adds up to. And Oh, like per kid? No, 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 not not per kid. So like if I teach a college algebra class in a semester, that is, it's it's three credit hours, but in terms of contact hours, it goes down as 48 contact hours. So if they're with me every day, that amounts yeah. to 48 hours. So I do that for all my classes, or I do that for all my classes. And I think I'm somewhere like in the, you know, 20 to 25,000 hour range of teaching. Like, how many hours have I spent standing in front of a classroom teaching? That's amazing. Well, it's, 
it's it's what I do. So I'm up there, and if yeah. I still have to like hold the book open or to look at my notes for exactly what I need to to write or do or how to explain things, like the first semester, I had notepads with like, okay, step by step, here's what I'm supposed to do, here's what right. I'm supposed to say. Uh, no, and so now yeah. half the problems that I do, I'm just making them up off the top of my head. My yeah. students like, how do you do that? I'm like, guys. Guys, yeah. if you've been doing the same thing for 20 years, I hope that you could do it without having to think so much about it. Yeah. I mean, anything, really. It's just that's, yeah, you're right about the the 10,000 hours. Is this something that you see? Like, is this is this the path? Like, another 20,000 hours of teaching? Like, is or do you have do you have any other, like, oh, I'd like to do, <laughs> I see something over there. I'd like to do that. See, I've worked with a lot of people that have these little five-year plans, and every five years they change jobs or they change what they're doing sure. in the job. That that's not me. I think I'm more like my dad. My dad did yeah. the same thing the whole time that he was working. Yeah, and I see myself doing this. So I, I admire I that. S- I'm not. I'm not trying to lead. I'm not trying to go like there was really nothing behind. No, question. no, no. It's like I'm very curious behind it. No, like I can. I think nine years is the first time I can consider retiring where I hit the certain combination of age and years of service, but I'll probably do more than that just so that my, I guess, retirement amount that I'd be pulling would be more, but I, Mm -hmm. I don't see myself doing anything different. I, you know, maybe more like side projects, like the podcast I do with my son. Yes. I wanted to talk about that. Are you winning? How did you land this, this name? It's a, it's an actual meme. It seems like somebody should have snagged this one, but but you got it. Well, there I think at one time there was an Are You Winning Son podcast, but I don't think they've put anything out in like five years. Yeah. But I'd had this idea rolling around in my head for a while, and I mentioned it to my son. He's like, Oh yeah, I'd like to do that. And this is my son who, you know, we homeschool our younger son. As like, you know, we, we need to get you doing something. Yeah. And so this is what kind of led to it. And I kept thinking like, what, what should we call it? What could we call it? Because I just want us to, you know, every couple of weeks sit down and talk about the games we've been playing and just have a conversation, record it, throw it out there. And we just landed on that because a lot of times I would just like go into his room and put my head around the door. Like, are you winning fun? (laughs) And he would just give me that look of like, dad, you were so annoying. Is he even and playing so we, a game that he would be winning? Like that's that's almost the best part of the question is that there are you can play games now that there is no winning. Like you don't win in like Minecraft or or Animal Crossing or things like that. Like he gosh, he plays almost anything. Like tonight he was streaming Amori. Um the there was an one of the days this week we were both streaming Cuphead, kind of going against each other. So I felt bad for him because he was playing on the Switch. And I was playing mm-hmm. on my computer and the load times are so much faster on the computer. Mm-hmm. I said, let's just, you know, I know that I'm going to be, have faster load times than you. So let's just see maybe death count, you know, how many deaths we have by the end. And <laughs> yeah, so that could be like an, are you winning some kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. But we, you know, they, he plays a lot of games where I could ask him, you know, how he's doing and yeah, he actually, I would say he maybe he plays too much, but he plays yeah. the games that I I don't play. Or yeah. every once in a while we do get to play something together. Like we played through all of Shredder's Revenge, uh, playing with nice. one of the other guys from the Backlog Busters and his kid. Um, that was that, that was pretty good. Nice. And are both kids into into games? This is just your your one. Nope, both. I mean, yeah, I've with me. Yeah, I think it was kind of a given that they would both be into games. It was just a matter of like what kind of games. Yeah, so like my you say son, that. I don't know if that's such a given. To be honest with you, I don't know. Maybe it is. We should we could poll, you know, our friends and whatnot. <laughs> but I I wonder if that's the case, or even if there's like a a time where they go. Maybe it's not for me because I think a lot of us maybe went through that. Like oh, I probably should grow out of this, and you take a break, and then you end up doing it until you're forty or beyond. So, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I remember listening to a podcast that Johnny Casino was on. And I think he was talking about, it was him or maybe another guy I listened to talking about how, you know, their daughter was into games, but then they just kind of got out of it. Yep. But I think my boys, 
they've always showed an interest in the games from the very beginning. So yeah, you know, probably starting with Wii Sports and then progressing to pretty much anything and everything. Now, my older son likes to play PC building simulator and yes. racing games. So I mean, he's showing me like. You know, all the cars that he's gotten in Burnout Paradise and that he's, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if he's gotten all the billboards, but, you know, he's got like his, whatever the top license is. I'm like, oh my gosh, how long have you been playing this? (laughs) Or He's been grinding. Well, one of the, one of my favorite examples, are you familiar with the game West of Loathing? I haven't played, but it's been recommended to me countless times, actually. I would love to dive into that game. Oh, it's not that expensive if you, I mean, you may already have I it. I actually know, might have it. I might, I might, I might have been given that a code for it, is it at some point. Black and white stick yeah. figure, Wild yeah. West RPG. You can beat the game in 10 hours easy. Um, definitely in 15 hours. I'm trying to remember. That my might be a back, son, backtrackers game. My son has put like 150 hours into it. Like beat the game. And then, yeah. oh, let me try a different person and let me try to, you know, speed run it. I'm like, what? I'm, I'm glad you like this game. And he said, yeah, it's a really funny game. I said, you understand that that's my humor that you're laughing at. My humor that outside of a video game you hate, but you yeah. are loving it. I don't know. It's like you, well, it's gotta be you nice though, man. Like it's, it's a, it's a built in thing. Like how many, how many parents and their kids like, like what do what are we going to talk about? It's, you know, it's, this is what they like and it's what you like. That's, I don't know. It's, it seems I, okay. It, it does sound nice, but then you run into the, you know, the cost of it all. Sure. Like, yeah. Uh, okay. So one switch is not going to be enough. Yeah. Because who's going to play? Oh, you wanted to play it too. Okay. Well, yeah. So we are, we are part of the problem with yeah. the switches because we have three. And it, we're not like Donnie Reese that, or some of these people that have like just piles of switches laying around. Like, <laughs> That's like court with each, these piles of PS fives. Like each of us has basically a switch that's designated to them. Yep. My, yeah. my struggle is going to be the whole, we should wait for like a birthday or a Christmas, like buy the game when it comes out and just have it in the closet. But it's like, well, the game comes out. So we're playing it on launch day. Like the notion of picking up a game and saving it for it to be like unwrapped as a gift. I don't know. I might, I gotta, I gotta, gotta figure that out. Cause it should be a but, thing, but I wanna play the game <laughs> on the well, launch I mean, that, day. I mean, that, that's so hard because like growing up, you know, we didn't have like the number of games that, that we have in this house, like physical games, just right. dwarfs what we had oh growing gosh. up. Now we had, yeah. We had a, a decent collection. We might have like 15 NES games, but you weren't getting one all the time because the it was much more cost prohibitive back then, you mm-hmm. know, to get one. And you better you better enjoy that there were no demos. So and and even back then you didn't know if the game you couldn't just go out to the store and, and buy it. Because it wasn't like here's a national release day for this I game. Know. It's like, oh, the game came out, but does your Walmart have it? No. How about the electronics boutique or software, et cetera? No. So you're kind of out of luck there. But like Splatoon 3 just came out. And my son, younger son, really likes Splatoon. So he really wants it. And so now there's this issue of, oh, but the first Splatfest is coming and I don't have the game. I'm like, well, if you had your own money. Uh, that that aligns things a little bit more, doesn't it? When you When you don't necessarily have to be the like provider i guess in that way for the for the excess for the luxury items like you don't feel as obliged to like we our kids have toys and everything they don't only get toys on their birthday right Right. like you you get toys throughout the year kind of thing so i imagine that's the case with games but i love this you kind of like i'm gonna not do it like if there's something that you really want and it's coming at a time that's not your birthday or something special then you're going to need to you know pony up for that so nice. if you want Splatoon 3, you could wait for your birthday, which is next month, or yeah. you know, find the money. And what's yeah. really been fun for them is that their birthday is almost exactly a month before every Pokemon release. So for a <laughs> while, they just wanted the new Pokemon. Like, all right, well, I'll tell you what, you're going to get it, but you have to wait a month for it to actually come out. Yeah. But Was that okay? Know, this, That'd be torturous. That sounds terrible. 
I mean, that's not the only thing they get, but they know, okay, well, sure. I know that in a month, dad's going to swing by and pick yeah. that up or it's, it's coming in. Mm. So you don't, yeah. you don't have to worry about it. You know that's going to be there. Right. But yeah, it's, it's almost, so it's almost I, like an aftershock birthday present. Like you, you, that's kind of nice, actually. And when you frame it that way, it's like, okay, it's not so bad. Well, I mean, you, I mean, we print out a piece of paper, you know, with the picture on there. It's like, hey, you know, we've ordered it and it is coming. So cool. So they, they, they okay, we've got that. Yeah. Um, but I don't go, I, especially this year, I'm not going out and buying a bunch of games. Mm-hmm. I used to be more prone to do that, but. Well, now you I'm have a backlog. Really my, now you're well, sitting yeah, on a it's thousand like, games. It's not like my spending habits are out of control. Like I hear some, or either some podcasters or see things on Twitter. I'm going, how do you guys have this much money just laying around to throw it, to throw at games? <laughs> and I've spent, okay, aside from money that I spent for some bundles that were going to support the war in Ukraine. Yeah. I've spent, five dollars and 40 cents on games this year that is amazing i See, but this is also gets game. into the the yeah it sounds like an obsessive challenge as well though you've replaced one for another but it but it was so i'll easy show to just you like, <laughs> but it's so easy to just like buy a game because it's on sale and buy this game because it's on sale now oh, i have bought some other i have bought some other i games feel very attacked with, right now ryan I, <laughs> <laughs> you're talking about me i'm right here <laughs> <laughs> well, if the shoe fits, yeah, damn, <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. I, it's just so frustrating that I, even some of the games that I've purchased this year, and it, you know, I had store credit for, you know, Microsoft Store or some credit with Best Buy. So, yes, I bought some stuff, but I had credit for. It, so that's like the one sure. kind of exception. I'm not just you're talking out of pocket, right? Because I, and especially especially with the way the year has gone. Like I, I just can't be spinning like I was before as much as I yeah. might want to. And there've been some, some crazy expenses. Um, like, you know, my son having surgery, I'm not, not sure if you heard about that, but my son with celiac disease had to have three feet of colon removed because it was just excess. Wow. And so that was a nice, you know, week stay in the hospital. Uh, Dude, I can't, I can't wrap my head around this. It wouldn't cost a thing. It wouldn't cost anything. You wouldn't pay anything here. Zero. Right. I mean, you say thank fortunately, you very much. It, fortunately, we do have insurance because I know that not everybody has insurance. And sometimes I complain even about the type of insurance that I have. Well, it doesn't cover as much and blah, blah, blah. But oh, man, I can't believe for as anything. much as the bills were showing up online, uh, it's like, okay, this is what the bill was. This is how much insurance sure. covered. I'm like, well, thank goodness. That's, that's just to make you feel a little bit better. Yeah, like you're you're still stuck with a sizable dollar, but like at least you don't have the first one. Yeah, Yikes. hey, that one aspirin that you took was $50. I'm like, I could have wow. brought in my own aspirin. Could have brought in a bottle uh, of them. Could have brought in a Costco but, bottle of them. But I will say that, you know, they took, they took fantastic care of my son. And, and I've been saying this all over the place. That I'm super proud of my son for how he how he handled himself going through all that, because, I mean, how many 15 year olds do you know that have had a colonoscopy, and then had laparoscopic surgery, mm-hmm. and had bags attached to them, and have to be in these embarrassing situations with nurses, and the way he handled everything has just it's, it's just blown my mind. That's awesome, man. But yeah. Now he can do anything. If you can do that at 15, it's like, man, the rest you're it's tough for sure. But what resiliency for the rest yeah, of Yeah, and life. this is and I think that's all probably connected with the issues that he's had with celiac disease and, and whatnot. But hopefully now everything is you know is fine for him. And yeah. Nice, man. Well, holy cow, we kind of we ran the gamut tonight, dude. We kind of well, probably even still just scratch the surface. I feel there's, there's another 15 <laughs> topics that can have you back on. But the internet mostly stayed together for us, I would say, this evening. Um, before we close things out, though, do you want to tell everybody, we mentioned your podcast with your son, kind of alluded to a backlog that you like to bust every once in a while. Um, before we go, do you have any closing thoughts? And if not, or if so, do you want to tell people where they can find 
all your, your more of your illustrious radio voice on the on the podcast airwaves well i don't know that i really have any closing thoughts i just want to say thank you for you know setting this up you know you've been one of these mythical creatures out there for so long <laughs> in the podcasting world and i'm going like oh man i can't wait to be able to talk to him like i hop into this little you know into a stream and he knows me as mathman1024 but he also knows me by my real name even though it's not there on twitch and i just you know i i appreciate what you what you've done in the, the community and it's always good to you know to hear your voice and it's again fantastic to be able to talk to you same face to you, face man. it's like same to you i'm heroes. gonna think of myself walking around like some sort of minotaur or something or centaur or something like i'm gonna like have some sort of like like limp <laughs> i don't know <laughs> like something's wrong with my legs <laughs> I well, if you're sensitive, I hope you're not limping. I just have to put you down at that point. <laughs> <I know. laughs> I'm very careless. I roll my ankles often. What can I say? Uh, yeah, that's how I'm gonna. <laughs> I wish people. This is this is for the YouTube watchers for sure. This uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be going around. My kids are gonna have no idea what the heck is he, he's is galloping like. around. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, man. This is. You're right. Like we've been. You know, we've been in the circles for for many, many years, actually. And, you know, I, I can even remember the days of the backlog busters when it was just a, a turkey and a, and a fat man in Vegas. And I feel like right. you've been at the helm of the backlog busters for, what, three, four years at this point? No, they invited me on at the very beginning of 2020. So two and a half years. Is that and it? I was, what the, I, dude, I don't know what time is anyways at this point. No, I have I, no idea. I, and whenever like you could have told me eight the, years, I would have believed you. <laughs> Well, when I got the call, I was, I mean, I was just completely surprised and humbled. And I remember that first episode, just feeling like a fanboy. Like, I don't want to geek out like, oh my gosh, I'm here with, the, <laughs> I'm here with these, these guys that I've just spoken to, um, like through messaging on Twitter or like, I remember you know, getting 100% in the messenger and getting like a handwritten note from, from Grouch. Like, this is this is crazy. I, I feel like I'm in some kind of secret circle now mm -hmm. and then getting to be on the podcast is just, I don't know. It, it's gone from random personalities on, on Twitter to these are real people that I could yes. pick up, pick up the phone and call and say, Hey, I've got this issue. Could, could, could we talk? Can we, you know, just, randomly find a time to get on the internet not not recording anything but just i, I want to talk face to face just to talk about some of the stuff that i'm going through yeah and I, I don't think i ever would have imagined that something like that could be possible people that i feel like th that i can trust that i these are not just acquaintances but these are these are friends yeah man and I, that's to me that's one of the most special things you know about this in particular the backlog busting community but we have there with the podcast it's very so, there, there's an identity to it, man. Everybody knows what to expect when they listen and when they jump into the discord and, and or wherever they are just chatting. It's like there's a it's 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 almost like there's an atmosphere, but in the digital space. And I don't know how else to describe it. And I don't know. I don't even know if Carpool Gaming has that, but definitely with the Backlog Busters, it's like I want to say there's like a smell, but in like the best way possible. Like, you know, it's like, it's, like it's a, you, it's tangible. It's I don't know exactly. What, yeah, it's like it's it's passable. Um, middle aged men bo is no. It's I don't know. There's something to it. It's obviously not a smell, but it's some. There's something that you know. There's such a focus on camaraderie and friendship and the that talk was the about video that games. Was, that was a word in my mind. Camaraderie. Yeah, that was what man. I was thinking about before you even said that it's just with these guys there, there are all these connections that we have. And I think that we are all for the most part, kind of in the, the same space in life mm -hmm. being relatively around the same age, you know, similar gaming experiences and backgrounds, having kids and experiencing gaming with our kids. And just like, we still enjoy gaming and you know, yeah. the, like the wide range that we play. And it's, I know it's like this big band of brothers as sometimes I think it's just so hard to explain that. And I'm not really like an emotional guy, but like, these are my friends. These are my brothers mm -hmm. and I, I, I love it. Yeah, man. We're, we're lucky to have discovered that this is a thing. There's, there's so many 
to your point earlier, there's so many other things we could be doing where everybody's busy. There's this is a, there's a choice that was made at some point that got you in a certain circle that got you in front of somebody else that got you the invite to do the podcast, which you thought you were just signing up for the podcast, but little did you know that these are, you know, lifelong friends from people across the United States or even the world. It's, it's, it is special. I'm glad that you, you talked about it, man. But I definitely encourage um, people to check out the backlog busters because there is a, um, it is rare in podcasting when people actually know things about video games and you guys actually know (laughs) things about video games. Most of us have no idea what the heck we're talking about, but it's like, if you actually want to know things, um, you guys have collected this ragtag bunch of, bunch of people. And then also skinny Matt, um, who know <laughs> you guys know things. It's really good. I got it. He gives me shots all the times. And then he kind of like just giggles to himself about it. And it's amazing. And I love it. So I gotta, I gotta take that, that, that opportunity. Oh, no, that's, that planned, is good. But. No, I give him crap all the time when he gets on. <laughs> as, soon as, he opens, as soon as he opens his mouth, you just have to hang your head and go, <sighs> All right. He's just a sweet guy, though. He's so sweet. But yet, I don't know, him and I share a kinship on on that. But um, yeah, so uh, Are You Winning, Son, the podcast. So you, you, so you want to plug Backlog, all my stuff, I guess? <laughs> Backlog Busters, the podcast. <laughs> Mathman 1024 is how... Do you say 1024? Like, is there a different... Like, I say 1024. That's how I read that number. You know, I go back and forth between 1024 or 1024. But yeah, you can find me on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube. Mathman nice. one zero two four. See, naturally, I said one zero two four. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to follow the backlog busters, that's backlog underscore busters, and the podcast that I do with my son, Are You Winning, Son? And that's <laughs> Are You Winning Pod. And uh, man, it is some. That's some in- interesting things with him. I let him do the cover art, and uh, he, <laughs> he lets me do. He lets me do the editing of the audio, and. He is. Um, <laughs> I'm looking at the cover he's, art he's right now, dude. It's so good. It is so good. People, the links are all in the show notes. You know, I, I'm saying to you as if the show notes already exist, but for the people listening, they're there. Click on them. Click the follow buttons. Um, Mr. Ryan Craig, thank you so much for carving out an hour and a half with me tonight, man. It's been a blast, and I I can't wait to have you back on the show. Well, thank you, Mr. The Pants. I appreciate it. Is that where you were expecting this conversation to go? Because I was, and I never really know what to expect. Um, thank you so much to Ryan. Guys, please follow on Twitter at Mathman1024. All the links are in the show notes, of course. I feel like that was I feel like that was pretty good, man. Lots of stuff happening, by the way, over at patreon.com slash carpool gaming. Sweet hangs with Donnie Reese. We did a, uh, one a couple weeks ago. We had some technical issues, but guess what? Another one. It's coming at you guys. I've got lots on my mind. I we're about to record it later on today, and I have a feeling I don't want to jinx it. I don't want to jinx. Just 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 to tune into that. Um, tons more exclusive content coming at patreoncom gaming at the three dollar tier and up. So please go check that out, man. Um, one thing I want to comment though on this this conversation with Ryan is um, you might have noticed a couple of weeks ago. I don't want to out him, but I feel like this is going to out him, and it is an accident. I don't mean it. <laughs> Sorry, Ryan. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had some internet connection issues, and um, you, you may have noticed that I didn't have an episode, and it was because of that. And so this week, I kind of anticipated maybe maybe those internet connection issues happen again. You might have noticed that throughout. Um, I always kind of shuffle back and forth on whether I should give you that heads up beforehand, but I don't really want to give you the excuse to like skip out, <laughs> you know, because like you might I might say there there's a little connection issue, and you might you might think it's catastrophic. I don't think that was catastrophic, but what I actually ended up doing in this episode versus maybe some other conversations I've had is I didn't jump in nearly as much. There's a couple times where where I was like, oh, I want to know more about that. But I actually kind of just like let Ryan go on. And I was like, kind of, I really enjoyed that. So um, yeah, it's funny how how some limitations can, can allow us to discover new things. But in any case, uh, thank you so much to Ryan. Thank you guys so much to you for supporting us. You can follow me on Twitter at Sean Capri, Sean like Connery, Capri like the pants. Uh, rate us on Apple Podcasts, by the way. I still check and sad to see... I haven't, I haven't seen a, I haven't seen a review. That's fine. Every single week we end the episode with a clip of Bobby Paul's, the late great Nintendo guru, one of the best people who ever lived on the planet, lost to COVID-19. 
and we honor his memory every single week by uh, by sharing a clip of just a, just a moment of the nearly infinite amount of hours that he has put out onto the, onto the internet. Thank you to Josh Stapleton for providing yet another clip, just tons of clips. If you guys want to provide a clip, by the way, there's a link in the show notes for you guys to do that. You can jump in on this. This week, it's uh, it's Bobby talking to Rebecca from the Nintendo Shack about meeting Garrett Bland, also of the Nintendo Shack, also of the RPG Cave, uh, and, and talking about wasting paper towels. So enjoy. I'll see you guys next week. Okay, bye-bye. You became a co-host on Nintendo Shack about, what, six months ago, give or take, yeah, about uh, then. Caro stepped down, mm-hmm. and then Donnie went on this hunt to find, you know, a co-host. Um, and then he hit a home run with you. And oh, then, thank you. And then a foul ball with Garrett Bland. Like no, he totally, no, he totally, about he totally <laughs> dropped the ball. <laughs> yeah, no, I love Garrett to death. We love Garrett. I love Garrett. <laughs> Let me tell you a quick story. So Garrett, I met Garrett face to face at Extra yeah. Life. Oh wow. And we were, <laughs> we were the final day, like we're done, whatever, the 24 hour stream went. We all go to breakfast. A bunch of us go to breakfast. And me, Sean Capri, and Garrett go to the bathroom. And the three of us go to the bathroom. And those two, they were a little quicker than me. And I'm done. And I go and I start to wash my hands. And Garrett's like, because you know he's like a bioengineer or something, right? He's or, so smart. Yeah, and he's <laughs> studying to become like this whatever. So he like points to the air dryer and he's like, Bobby, this is what you need to use. Instantly, I'm like, in my head, I go, Garrett, that was the dumbest thing you've ever done <laughs> because I'm the type of guy that goes the polar opposite. So I go to the paper towel things and I start banging it down. Oh, no. And, and, I'm, <laughs> and he's like, it's going like, you know, normally you just get a little piece of paper towel. It went all, I'd let it go all the way to almost to the ground. And then I picked <laughs> it up and I kept hitting it. And he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, what, Garrett? And he's like, no, man, you can't do that. You can't like, be doing that to Garrett. And I'm like, so I literally just like use for a second. And I throw it in the trash. Right. And he goes, Bobby, he goes, you're, you're, you're killing me. He's like, guy, he's like. Oh, he's no. like, he's like, he goes, 30 years from now, there's going to be a sea turtle dying because it's choking. And I go, he guilt trips you. I said, I won't be here 30 years from now. So I'm not worried about it. Right. He got so upset. Oh, and then, no. so then I constantly like, he would come into the streams and I would go in the other room and grab paper towels. Like he would be like breaking like stones about the game I'm playing. And I go get paper towels and I start unrolling them live on stream. Drove him crazy. Drove him crazy. <laughs> So, I'm not surprised. That sounds like Garrett. Oh, I love that guy, though. I love him to death. 